Pulling a vacuum is extremely important for a refrigeration system. Not only are we dropping the pressure by removing the air pressure, the nitrogen and oxygen from a refrigeration system, getting it down where we can replace it with a pure clean refrigerant, more important than all of that is dehydrating the system. So the word of today will be dehydration. We need to get this moisture out of the system. The moisture in the system turns to an acid and the acid is the biggest enemy refrigeration system. The acid was popular back in the 60s and 70s, but it's always been an enemy of a refrigeration system. So we have to dehydrate the system so that we get the moisture out. Now you're going to hear people say, oh, don't worry about pulling a good vacuum. I've never done it before. I've never had an issue. There's two things connected to that. One is going to be the old oil. Before we had mineral oil and mineral oil was very forgiving. We we're still supposed to pull our vacuum down to the proper microns back then, but we could get away with it for the most part. It would take a lot longer before it turned to an acid. A lot of times your filter dryer would pick up a lot of that moisture before it went to the whole system. So it was very forgiving. But now we have PoE oil, polyester oil, and the polyester oil used to be an acid. It's actually a dehydrated acid and it's hygroscopic, meaning it has an affinity. It wants to absorb that water so it can go back to being an acid again. Think of little gizmo, great little cute little creature works great, but then you get it wet and you end up with gremlins and gremlins tear apart a refrigeration system. It eats away the evaporator cool, eats away the condensing cool and starts eating away on the compressor. So that's gonna be a very big problem. The other thing is you won't see the problems of improper vacuum right away. It's going to take time before this damage starts happening. So your people say, ah, oh, I never worry about that proper vacuum, but it's taking life off the system. Let's say the system should last 15 years. Now it's only lasting eight, five, or even three years before you're having all this damage. And the damage is irreversible. The acid inside the system starts eating away the refrigeration piping. It starts eating away in the evaporator coil, eating away in the condensing coil. The acid starts causing major long-term damage. That causes the leaks in the evaporator coil, leaks in the line set, leaks in the condensing coil. Now that copper that's floating around to the system is also gonna have an issue. That copper is gonna stick to the hottest part of the system. Inside the compressor, it's going to be very hot. And inside that sink, we have pistons in there, moving parts in there. The copper starts sticking or plating, copper plating inside the compressor. So if we have a cylinder like this and we fill that full of copper, the cylinder gets smaller and smaller. Now the piston has more and more drag as it's moving as well as it's copper plating the piston and also the valves and any other moving part in that system. That causes wear on the compressor and the compressor eventually burns out. The acid also eats away at the windings inside the motor of the compressor. As we eat the insulation off the windings, we end up with the compressor shorting out. The acid also eats away at thermostatic expansion valves. All those little moving parts, little diaphragm, the acid starts doing damage to those TXVs. And if that's not enough, we could have enough moisture left that the moisture starts freezing inside the TXVs and cause erratic or irregular TXV operation. So acid in these systems is absolutely a nightmare, a complete nightmare, and it's irreversible damage. It will cause damage even though you don't see the process or the results right away. For example, an installer, they may never see the damage, but a service technician and especially the homeowner is definitely seeing that damage in the long run. So making sure that we pull a proper vacuum is the most important thing for the installation of an AC system. If we have poor electrical, we can solve that later. Units not level, we can solve that later. Poor ductwork, we can solve that later. But not having a proper vacuum is something that we can't undo. We can clean it up, but the damage caused to the evaporator coil, line sets, compressor, condensing coil, all that damage is going to be long term and we cannot undo that. Vacuum is the most important thing we can do. Now, a lot of people think when we pull a vacuum, it's pulling the liquid out, and that's just not the case. Pulling a vacuum doesn't mean the liquid just gonna flow out of there. What we do need to do is use this vacuum pump to drop the pressure inside of a refrigeration system. By dropping the pressure, we drop the saturation temperature of the H2O, also called dropping the boiling point of the H2O. We can literally make this moisture boil from a liquid to vapor at room temperature. By dropping the pressure, we drop that boiling point and we can then boil that water out. Now we can't pull the water out in liquid form, but once it changes state from liquid to vapor, now we have vapor molecules. We also know what we call vapor pressure. So now that we have vapor pressure, it goes from a high pressure to a low pressure and we're able to pull that vapor pressure out. A lot of people say don't pull too low of a vacuum because you'll pull the oil out. Really, we'd have to get it so low to where we make the oil boil from liquid to vapor, which is just about impossible except in a laboratory. So that's a myth about being able to pull the oil out by having too low of a vacuum. But it is important for us to pull the vapor out of that system by boiling the moisture from a liquid to vapor. 
Now let's talk about our pump. Our pump is going to be the lowest pressure point. Here, right here at this point where I'm pulling my vacuum, it's going to be the lowest point. To get any type of air to move, it goes from a higher pressure location to a lower pressure location. So if I have my vacuum pump hooked up to my system and I'm pulling a vacuum, we're going to see the lowest pressure point here. If I have H2O inside my evaporator coil, it's going to be boiling, changing state from liquid to vapor, and I'll have my vapor pressure here. That vapor pressure is going to go to the lower pressure point, meaning it's going to flow through refrigeration piping, through our hose connections, through our hoses to our pump. So we want to make sure that we're checking our vacuum pressure as far away from the pump as practically possible. Now most of the time practically possible means we're going to be checking at our hose connections over here, but when possible I like to put a T at my evaporator coil and put my micron gauge there. Because I can be at 500 microns here and still be at 2000 microns on this end. So if I know that at my evaporator coil, at the farthest possible location, if I'm at 500 microns there, the moisture is boiling from a liquid to vapor and we're dehydrating that system. Now most of the time we can only get it to this point here, but still as far away from the pump as practically possible so that we know that we're dehydrating that system. I don't want to know that I'm at 500 microns here. I want to know that I'm at 500 microns in my unit to boil away all of that moisture to prevent acid. Key point of that. Now the other thing we can do to speed that up is use larger hoses and also remove the Schrader ports in here. That's going to reduce any of the pressure drop. So by having that pressure vapor flowing in the evaporator coil and the condensing coil, allowing it to flow smoothly means we dehydrate a lot faster. Some other things we can do to speed up the dehydration or speed up the boiling of it is not only drop the pressure, we can also add heat energy. For example, I can turn my blower on and move airflow across my evaporator coil. By moving enough warm air across that evaporator coil, we cause any H2O or moisture to boil away a lot faster. We can do the same thing on our condensing coil, except it's typically not as practical, but in very cold climates, you can actually put bags around this and add heat to it. And the easiest way is our crankcase heater. By heating or energizing that crankcase heater, it's causing the oil to heat up by raising the boiling temperature. Doing that is really important because we can boil away any leftover refrigerant in the system or any moisture that may have gotten into that oil. You can always use a tank heater, heat guns, and many other things you can do to make sure you keep this warm. But by keeping it warm, you can speed up your dehydration process. Now, some other things we need to talk about is moisture is everywhere. It's in the air all around us. I've lived in Las Vegas. I've also lived in Phoenix, Arizona. And in those very dry climates, there's still a lot of moisture in the air. And moisture is sticky. Moisture likes to stick to surfaces. So on this metal right here, it feels dry, but the moisture from the air is literally attached to this metal. So anytime we're working on a refrigeration system and air is introduced to that, we end up with moisture inside of a refrigeration system. Even in those very dry climates, moisture is everywhere. And so we must get rid of that moisture. So that's a key part of what we need to do is dehydration. But another thing we can do is try to prevent the moisture from getting in when at all practical by keeping the line sealed as much as possible. By flowing nitrogen through a refrigeration system, when possible, it prevents moisture from getting back inside this unit. Also, when we're not working on the system, keeping it in positive pressure. And before I pull a vacuum, I like to run nitrogen or purge nitrogen through my refrigeration system so that I push as much of that moisture out as possible. I also like to leave this at least one PSI before I hook my vacuum pump up, so that way I don't have moisture rushing back in. And anytime we have to stop our vacuum for any reason, I want to break the vacuum with dry nitrogen because if this is below atmospheric pressure and I take my hose off, the air, and more importantly the moisture from the air, rushes back into my system and contaminates everything possibly worse off than we had to do before. Now it's going to take time for this to happen. It depends on the size of the equipment we're working with. It depends on the size of our pump. It depends on our hoses, what kind of restrictions such as valve cores, and how much moisture contamination is in that system. Also, the oil plays a part of that as well. If we end up with PoE oil, we're not just going to be able to pull the moisture out. We're going to have to use other processes like filter dryers to be able to get that moisture back out. Because once it turns to an acid, our vacuum pump is not going to be able to dehydrate that system. So the time it takes could be anywhere from 10 minutes to multiple days, depending on how big that system or how contaminated that system is. So it's very important for us to consider that. The other thing that's very important for us to address is going to be if we pull a vacuum too fast. You're going to hear a lot of people talk about this. On the EPA test, it says if you pull a vacuum too fast, it's possible for the moisture to freeze. And the answer for the EPA test is yes. But let's talk about the practicality of that. In a system, it's highly unlikely. 
Possible, highly unlikely. In this vacuum chamber, I could use a small enough tube with enough volume of liquid and I can make ice in this vacuum chamber by pulling a fast vacuum. In reality, it's gonna be unlikely. We need a large volume of water. Remember water is a refrigerant. As that water is changing state from a liquid to vapor, it's absorbing a massive amount of heat. The remaining liquid can then possibly freeze. In a refrigeration system, that's highly unlikely for a few things. One, we have moisture everywhere on the system, but it's spread out. So as I'm pulling it from a liquid to vapor, it's changing state straight into a vapor and it's not enough remaining liquid for it to actually freeze. So it's very unlikely for that to happen just because there's not enough volume of water for it to do that. Now, if somebody was to contaminate or pour water in an evaporator coil, then yes, we could end up with that scenario happening. The other thing is surface area. Think about how much tubing we have through this whole entire system and how much aluminum fins we have through this whole entire system. There is so much surface area, even if you had a little bit of liquid H2O in there, there's so much surface area, it would heat that ice up so quick that it would then boil from a liquid to vapor and it's extremely unlikely for us to have ice. Now let's talk about the scenarios that that could happen. If we're pulling a vacuum and let's say it's below 40 degrees, then yes, the surface area, the air temperature, the temperature of these coils are already at a very low temperature and it is possible for the remaining moisture to turn to an ice and have ice crystals and we cannot pull a vacuum with those ice crystals. So yes, it is possible. Solution, heat the system up or wait till a warmer day to pull a vacuum. Another scenario would be a chiller system. A chiller has the evaporator coil surrounded by moisture or H2O water. We're literally chilling water instead of air. If we have a leak in that system, we could end up with H2O liquid moisture inside that system. The solution to that is to push nitrogen through to push as much of that moisture out as possible. And there's also a process called triple evacuation, which we'll talk about later on, that does that as well. But in those scenarios, we're looking at multiple days and we're also looking at heating that water up so that we can pull those proper vacuums. So there's a lot of other steps involved in that. So while it is possible, it's highly unlikely for that to happen. For us to properly dehydrate and prevent the acid formation, we wanna make sure we use a good quality pump, that we use our hoses as short as possible and as big as possible to reduce any restrictions. We take away restrictions such as Schrader quarters. We wanna make sure when possible for us to heat the unit and also for us to check the vacuum with an electronic vacuum gauge or a digital micron gauge to make sure that we're reading in microns at a low enough temperature far from the pump is practically possible so that we know that moisture is boiling away from a liquid vapor. And when possible, we can heat the system so that will speed that process up. It's unlikely for us to be able to freeze moisture in it by pulling a vacuum too fast. And it's also almost impossible for us to be able to pull any of the oil out of the system from too low of a vacuum. So vacuum and dehydration is so very important. Dehydration, dehydration, dehydration. We talked about running nitrogen through the system. When possible, we wanna make sure that we are using nitrogen to push through the system. We also call it dry nitrogen because there's no H2O, no moisture inside of that. By pushing nitrogen through, and it doesn't take a lot, we just wanna push or flow it through, it'll help push some of that out. I don't need pressure to make that happen because if you had too much pressure, the moisture can actually condense back. We just push those contaminants out with nitrogen. Now, some people like to use CO2. The problem with CO2 is there's many different grades of CO2 and CO2 can have moisture content in it. So moisture from the CO2 can end up contaminating your system. It's also possible for the right conditions for CO2 to turn into dry ice or turn into a solid. And now you end up with solid CO2 that you're trying to pull out on top of having to deal with your moisture in the first place. So when possible, I typically like to use dry nitrogen and push that refrigerant, push those contaminants out of that system before I pull a vacuum. Pulling a liquid out with the vacuum is almost impossible. However, what we can do is drop the pressure and by dropping the pressure, we drop the saturation or boiling temperature. We can then make the, in this case, H2O boil or change state from a liquid to a vapor. That vapor has what we call vapor pressure and our vacuum pump can pull out that vapor pressure. It can literally then start removing that vapor pressure out of the system. So in liquid form alone, we can't do anything, but making that refrigerant or making that H2O boil or change state from liquid to vapor, we can then pull that vapor out and that's going to dehydrate the system. The saturated temperature for water at sea level under standard atmospheric conditions is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. That's at zero PSIG. What we're gonna do is drop that pressure below atmospheric pressure and we can make that water boil at a much 